Coming up on DTNS, we break down the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip, Galaxy S20, and Galaxy Buds, Galaxy of Samsung announcements, plus a U.S. intelligence cryptography backdoor from the 1980s, and should they cancel Mobile World Congress this year? This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, February 11th, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the dark forests of Finland, I'm the very awake Patrick Beja. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, shout out to Joe, who is also producing the show uh, in assistance today. And uh, also, uh, shout out to us. We, we were in a great conversation about podcasting gear uh, before the show. If you want to hear that, you got to be a Good Day Internet subscriber. Get it by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. A new Nielsen study shows that in the last three months of 2019, in the U.S., Netflix accounted for 31% of streaming to televisions. YouTube was second with 21%. Hulu came in third with 12%. Amazon took 8%. Other free and ad-supported options, including new offerings from Apple or Disney, for example, took a combined 28% chunk of viewership as well. Nielsen also reported that overall, in the U.S., video viewing on TVs that streaming now makes up 19 percent those christmas movies on netflix very popular microsoft is reversing its plans to by default install a microsoft search extension for office 365 pro plus customers using chrome which would have changed users default search engine to bing the installation includes Microsoft's search in Bing intranet search capability. A new plan for the extension's rollout will come in the next few weeks. That was the enterprise thing that sysadmins could have worked around, but it sounds like Microsoft's going to do the right thing and make it an option, not something you have to opt out of. U.S. District Judge Victor Marrero ruled in favor of the Sprint T-Mobile merger, which still needs the California Public Utilities Commission to weigh in before it can go forward, but it's pretty close now. Attorneys general from a dozen states argued the merger would stifle competition and raise prices, but the judge found that Sprint, and I quote, does not have a sustainable long-term competitive strategy ouch, and will in fact cease to be truly national. Double ouch. If the merger was not allowed, uh, it, he figured Sprint would go away anyway. So you know what? It's not going to hurt competition if Sprint dies. Uh, the case may yet be appealed and the attorneys general are reviewing their options. So we may not be done with this part of it either. Apple has joined the Fast, Fast Identity Online or FIDO Alliance, which makes a universal second factor or U2F an open standard meant to replace passwords. Other members include Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and Samsung. Chrome, Firefox, Edge, and Opera browser natively support UTF, and in iOS 13.3, Safari also supports FIDO2 compliant uh, physical security keys like YubiKey. And Google's partnering with the nonprofit Defending Digital Campaigns, or DDC, to distribute Titan security keys for free to political groups, plus offer help setting up the second factor keys. DDC already offers reduced price YubiKeys. Those are all useful if you want to do universal second factor, like Patrick was just talking about. All right, let's go from YubiKeys to FTCs. Indeed, the, UFFTC, the U.S. FTC has requested information from Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft, or as we like to call them in France, the GAFAM, because we use uh, Google as a substitute for Alphabet, um, about mergers that were too small to report to anti antitrust agencies. The companies are asked to provide terms, scope, structure, and purpose for each transaction made between January 1st, 20. 2010 and January 31st, 2019. They will also be asked to provide details on post-acquisition integration, product development, and pricing. The FTC said the request was part of a study of the issue of companies buying potential competitors to reduce competition. The results of the study are intended to inform future policy. 
Yeah, you accidentally said January 31st, 2019. It was December 31st, 2019. But but essentially, right. not, they want a decade's worth of information about small mergers that previously weren't required to be reported. And the idea is they want to look at that and say, well, should they have been? Do we need to change our policy and make companies report this? This isn't meant, although they didn't say they wouldn't use it for that, but it's not meant to be a punitive investigation. Yeah, I wonder how much, you know, a, a small, uh, you know, a, a small purchase of a small company that a company does where they don't have to report it, okay, not doing anything wrong, how many of those cumulatively become a problem? Yeah, if you're consistently putting out of business your competitors, yeah, maybe. It seems like anything that could potentially be a um, competition issue would need to be reported. So definitely something like Instagram bought up by Facebook would need to be reported, I suppose. Because Although that was, was big enough, it qualified for the reporting anyway. Exactly, yeah, yes, right. absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems, un uh, well, we don't have the data, but it seems to me unlikely that something that's so small it doesn't need to be reported would be uh, an actual threat to competition. But who knows, maybe cumul cumulatively, as you said, it might. Well, we talked about Mobile World Congress, and it might be a strange event this year. Uh, Facebook, Vivo, and Intel joined Amazon, Sony, LG, Ericsson, McAfee, NTT Docomo, and NVIDIA in canceling plans to attend the event in Barcelona, which is set to start on February 24th. Google and Microsoft are still planning to go to MWC, but more companies are still reviewing plans. 2,800 exhibitors are still planning to attend as of Tuesday morning. However, the GSMA has said that any attendee from China must prove they were quarantined for two weeks prior to attending the show. Reuters sources say that the GSMA board will meet Friday to discuss canceling the conference altogether. The board contains 26 leaders of telecoms groups and is chaired by Stefan Richard, the CEO of Orange. So it's starting a week from Monday. Uh, so we've got uh, just, just under two weeks uh, before it starts. They're going to wait till Friday to make the decision, uh, which I suppose logistics require it. I don't know. It, well, I, I also think like how many other companies might pull out by then. Well, then maybe they're waiting for companies to make their decisions. A lot of them may make their yeah. decisions in the next couple of days. And mm -hmm. if not enough companies are coming, maybe that helps them make the decision. Look, nobody's going to be here anyway. Uh, let's pull it. But for small businesses that have spent a lot of money preparing for this and, and maybe future success hinges on it, that that can be a problem. And they need to take that into consideration, too. Um, there's also like a legitimate public health concern with the coronavirus. Uh, you know, there's no doubt about it. It's hard to tell where the line is between overreacting and not being careful enough. Uh, Patrick, what do you what do you think they should do? Um, I think that that kind of decision, of course, they can make it themselves. But I, it seems what I'm not hearing at all is people and organizations consulting health authorities to make those decisions. And mm. especially in the case of GSMA, I think this, deciding to cancel it, of course, if they want to be overly cautious, but as you said, when does it start bordering on paranoia, um, they can cancel it. But it would seem to me that for all of those 2,800 exib exhibitors, um, if the health author authorities are saying, look, it's fine, just do it, I, I would think that they should probably listen to that advice. But, no, uh, and I think that's what they have been doing up till now, is saying, look, the health, the health authorities say we should do it. People in Barcelona say we should do it. Uh, and so what we're saying is we'll do temperature screening. We'll make sure people coming directly from China have been quarantined for 14 days. Yes. Uh, we'll advise you not to shake hands. But companies are pulling out anyway. And at a certain point, it may become a financial decision more than a public health decision because so many companies have pulled out. It may not be worth doing the show. Possibly. I would suspect that the ones who pull out so late uh, are either insured for these kinds of things or are still paying. And out mm. of the few that have been pulling out, it's not like there's 100 exhibitors. There's, there's almost 3,000. So I guess there's a lot of business that should be happening there, even if um, those big ones have pulled out. Maybe a lot of small, small ones have pulled out too, but I guess we'll mm -hmm. know on Friday. I guess so. Uh, Switzerland's Crypto AG is a company that started building code-making devices for the Allies and the United States Army in World War II. 
Uh, it still to this day provides encryption systems to more than 120 countries. However, uh, the Washington Post and a German broadcaster, ZDF, got a look at some Central Intelligence Agency documents that showed that throughout the Cold War, Crypto AG was secretly owned by the U.S. CIA and Germany's BND intelligence agencies. The BND left the company in the mid-90s, but the CIA stake ended in 2016, so not that long ago. The advent of digital encryption reduced the usage and utility of the company for the agencies. We're talking about analog encryption here, not digital. But at its height, the intelligence agencies used their access to Crypto AG to access communications during the Iranian hostage crisis, the Falklands War, the Egypt-Israel peace negotiations, Libya's bombing of a West Berlin disco in 1986. Iranian communications were allegedly 80 to 90 percent readable during the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, according to documents seen by The Post and ZDF. Swiss Info reports the Swiss government officially opened an investigation into crypto, and the general export license for crypto devices has now been suspended until open questions have been clarified. Dang. Well, uh, and, you know, a lot of, lot, lot of chatter about this today, and, you know, so much of it is like, countries were paying top dollar for something to get spied on, uh, and it's it's it, if you hadn't gotten CIA documents in the hands of uh, obviously publications who who want to make the the situation public, no one would have known about it. What kind of information was gathered? How did it change the course of the, a variety of crises, Tom? As you laid out, you know, I'm not totally sure about that, but yeah, I I I can I can imagine Switzerland being like. Hold on a second. You did we, what? We, <laughs> We're you, neutral. <laughs> yeah, we. Yeah, that's that. That's that's not what we do. Let, let's let's halt this whole thing. Even though, yes, it sounds like uh, the devices that were used at the time are are in decline because our technology has advanced so much. But still, a pretty big deal. That what uh, strikes me when I read this is uh, in, in a company, well, in an intelligence uh, organization that has had that kind of access for a very long time, I understand a little bit better why they are that livid and uh, frightened and worried about end-to-end uh, -end encryption. It, it, I, it doesn't change my uh, judgment mm -hmm, on end-to-end -end mm -hmm. encryption, but it might, this is very anecdotal and small piece of evidence, but it might actually be a bigger deal for them than I previously imagined. Right, because backdoors in digital are much harder than these kinds of analog backdoors. And you're, I, I, you're right, Patrick, have, being used to like, but we always get to have access to this information. <laughs> I mean, China and the Soviet Union never bought this stuff, so they didn't have access there. Uh, but, you know, large parts of the world, that makes a difference. Moving on to Microsoft News. The company launched a preview SDK for developers to adapt applications for dual screen devices running Windows 10X. Among the tools are an emulator to see how apps would work since no Windows 10X hardware is actually out yet. The SDK includes patterns for three main kinds of apps, including expanding apps across two screens, putting an app on one screen and tools on another, and running connected apps side by side for easier multitasking. Microsoft also added dual screen support for its UI toolkit on the Xamarin cross-platform development platform, and is also making React Native dual screen modules available. Microsoft is also proposing to the W3C, a new JavaScript API and CSS media query that support dual screen devices. Big on dual screens. Also, out of Microsoft Developer Day, Windows 10X separates system, drivers, and apps in a way that lets it reboot and apply an OS update in 90 seconds. Nice and snappy. Microsoft uses container technology for Win32 apps, meaning they can't interfere with system files or data. Also, if Windows 10X uh, runs on an Intel Lakefield processor, developers can choose which core the app runs on. That's kind of nice. Powerful apps can run on the larger core for performance, while lightweight apps can run on the smaller core and save battery. I mean that that the 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 ability to run on the different cores in the lake field is pretty nifty, uh, and Windows 10X taking advantage of that is pretty cool. But 90 second reboots for a system update just sounds like <laughs> heaven, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah, it's Christmas. You know, um, the Nintendo Switch updates incredibly fast. Uh, when I compare this to my PlayStation 5, 4, 
Sorry, I don't have a PlayStation 5. <laughs> Rumors. Bye. Ah, Rumors. now the truth finally comes out. Um, which takes, you know, as much as regular systems. It is truly, it, it encourages people to update more and uh, more quickly. So I think that actually does matter beyond the wow factor. Um, yeah, and beyond that, you know, it's cool that we're getting uh, companies to take a serious look at how dual screen devices are going to work because this is going to uh, percolate to the entire industry as dual screens because become a bigger and bigger part of that industry. So Yeah, the, the, the Windows Duo, uh, Microsoft Duo, is, is, is expected to come out by the holidays. And when it comes out, they want to have apps for it. Uh, so that's why you put the SDK now out now at the Microsoft 365 Developer Day. Hopefully get some people making some cool stuff. Uh, by then, and and then get people excited about Windows 10X with these innovations. Of course, everybody's going to say, well, could you do that for Windows 10 regular, the 90-second update? A little more complicated, I think, uh, given what you have to do. You, you have a more limited hardware profile with Windows 10X, I'm assuming. But if anybody's a Windows engineer and knows uh, whether you could or why you couldn't do a 90-second update, why you couldn't containerize things the way they have in 10X on regular Windows 10, I'd be very curious to hear that feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Let's talk about those Samsung Galaxy announcements, uh, starting with the one that leaked out, we knew the name, and then they did an advertisement on the Oscars Monday before they even put out the name officially, the Galaxy Z Flip, a 6.7-inch screen when unfolded, but it is a glass screen, not a plastic one, that folds up into a clamshell form factor, just like the Razer. 200,000 folds, they say. We'll, we'll see if it breaks like the Razer did when CNET puts it in its little machine. Uh, the cover display is just a little thin band. When it's folded up, though, it can show notifications, time, and battery life, and they even showed it being used as a viewfinder. So if you wanted to do a selfie without opening up the clamshell, you could do that. Uh, purple, black, and in some countries, gold. There's also a special Olympic gold version that will be given to Olympic athletes in Tokyo. Uh, you get access to YouTube Premium uh, as part of the plan. I'm not sure for how long. Uh, I, I didn't see a, a term. I assume it's something like a year. Uh, also, uh, they talked about the flex mode where you can kind of have it as a laptop and do hands-free things and selfies and stuff. And there'll be a, a Tom Brown edition with the Tom Brown stripe on it. Uh, that'll be shown off at Fashion Week in New York starting tomorrow. It's a custom case. Galaxy Z Flip available February 14th for $1,380 it's a foldable. People are skeptical about foldables. Sarah, Patrick, did this do anything to change your views? No. Uh, I. Yes. <laughs> ah, good. I we have to say, I mean, yes. you know, well, here's the thing. It's, it's, and, and we talked about this with Charlotte Henry on the show yesterday. The foldable model, you know, it's not going anywhere. It's going to get better. Companies are going to figure it out. But as soon as I hear something like, 200,000 folds and you're good. Even if that's true, I'm like, well, after 200,000 folds, now I got to get a new phone, even though I probably would way before that anyway. There there are just, there are some form factor things that I, I will not be a first adopter of this, but I am really curious to see how much people love them. Patrick, well, you I said yes, it changed your mind. Doctor. Well, not quite changed my mind, but it's a confirmation that this is an interesting evolution for um, the, the devices that we use all the time. I think I'm still not convinced that it's for me, but there are two things that I thought were interesting. First, um, it is leaps and bounds better than what we had last year. This is, I think, much more of a product than a concept. It's also much more affordable. It's a smaller uh, screen, but it's still better technology, and it's more affordable than the Fold they presented last year. Um, and the second thing is they presented it as a very premium uh, device. Of course, it's expensive, but they have the shiny thing. It feels like a thing you want to show off, a party, an accessory uh, mm -hmm. almost. And um, I think that there might be a market for this specific type of um, devices. The, the viewfinder-ish uh, little band when the 
phone is closed is also a little bit more uh, functional than I expected it to be. So overall, it's still not for me, but it's uh, I'm pleasantly surprised. It does feel like a fashion accessory. Uh, and, and I don't mean that as a criticism. Uh, you know, it's got that mirror finish on it. Uh, it would drop really nicely in a purse. Uh, and, and I think that's why they brought Tom Brown into this to try to, to try to exactly. sell that aspect of it, uh, rather than just a functional. Cause a lot of people who are just into function are like, why do I need it to fold? Uh, but having it fold as a, you know, cute little fashion accessory, as, as Charlotte said yesterday, kind of like a compact, I think starts to make a lot of people think, okay, well, that's interesting if they can afford it. Like you said, it is a premium device at $1,380. Uh, let's talk about the Galaxy S20, uh, which is available in three models. The S20 is $999, 6.2-inch screen, 4,000 milliamp hour battery. There's also the S20 Plus, which is a 6.7-inch screen, 4,500 milliamp hour battery, and that's 1199 And if you want to spend more money than you would on a Galaxy Z Flip, you can get the S20 Ultra, which is a 6.9-inch screen, uh, 5,000 milliamp hour battery, $1,399. All three of these are 5G, although the Plus and the Ultra support millimeter wave, uh, which here in the U.S. is what Verizon does. Uh, others have that and some other frequencies. Uh, so if you're in an area that only has millimeter wave service, you won't be able to use the Galaxy S20. You'd have to get the S20 Plus or the S20 Ultra. Uh, Samsung says that they're going to launch an S20 with millimeter wave support in Q2. Uh, that doesn't mean that you won't be able to use the S20 on 5G. It just means you'd it, some carriers may not have it. For instance, Verizon's not going to sell the S20 at launch. It's going to only get to sell the Plus and the Ultra. Uh, this, the phones also have 120 hertz refresh rate, so buttery smooth uh, vision on the display. Uh, hole punch uh, camera. Qualcomm 865 Snapdragon, solid processor in there. Starts at 12 gigabytes of RAM, up to 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5 for the Ultra. And 128 gigabytes of storage to start, but that goes up too. They're putting Google Duo uh, in the dialer of your phone. And if you have the connection for it, aka 5G, you can do high def video over Google Duo. So good news for Google Duo and also uh, good news for Samsung users who now get video chat uh, right there in their phone app. Uh, there's also something called Music Share, which will let you share a Bluetooth connection to listen to songs together. There's Space Zoom which is using the folded lens, meaning there's no bump in this camera, to do a hybrid of optical and digital zoom to offer an effective 100x zoom on the ultra and 30x on the plus and the regular. Uh, they also kept, uh, until Patrick was about to puke, uh, talk about 8K <laughs> video recording at 24 frames per second. Uh, you can take 32 megapixel stills out of that. You can edit 8K video on the phone. There's a deal with YouTube, so you can upload your 8K video to YouTube or stream it to a Samsung 8K QLED TV. Uh, there's super steady zoom, uh, nighttime hyperlapse shooting, something called single take, where you can use all the cameras at once and then pick which of the videos and or stills out of the single take that, that you want to have. Uh, smart binning is how they get that 108 megapixels out of a 12 megapixel camera uh, by combining nine pixels into one on the Ultra. And they even have some gaming partnership. Microsoft Forza Street coming to mobile for the first time in the Galaxy Store in the spring. They've got three other Microsoft titles as well. Pre-order for all three models starts February 21st with wide availability coming on March 6th. Galaxy S20. Patrick, what do you think? Um, this is all about the camera. They spent the most time on the camera, and this confirms how little phones change. Um, well, most phones, I guess we have foldables now, but most phones change very little from one model to the next. Um, and the camera is very impressive, or seems to be very impressive at least. I don't think anyone is going to really be using 8K, although you can do that for editing and do tricks with editing and cropping and stuff like that. But uh, the, the one take thing is really cool. The zoom can be useful. Um, the camera looks very, very impressive. And I think that's 5G and a lot of other features are kind of sticker features that aren't super useful for most people for a long time. But the camera is what uh, will convince a lot of us, I think. Oh, uh, I did want to add a clarification on the pixel binning. I think you had it reversed. So it's 108 megapixel yes. sensor. And then through pixel binning, they can give you a really good 12 megapixel 
image on low light by taking advantage of the additional pixels to uh, pull in the extra. Luminous. Which actually does bring does bring a, the eternal question of is the sensor large enough to take advantage of 108 megapixels? Because that's always the issue. You can add megapixels, but if the sensor is small, then the pixels are tiny and don't get enough light. They say it works, but we'll have to wait for tests because this is a common um, issue with uh, large numbers and megapixels. Well, I mean, it's an issue with... Uh, can cameras on smartphones in general, but a lot of them have been relying heavily on in-camera or in-phone processing to kind of give you the best optimal picture out of the information it pulls. And they work pretty well. I mean, they're not, I mean, they're, they're never going to replace like a, a 5D or, or a full frame format digital camera with a telephoto lens. But considering this thing fits in your pocket, it does pretty well. No, I think the question is more, does the 108 megapixels really add a lot uh, when compared to, you know, 12 megapixels? Because if the, the, the pixels become so small, yes, the digital processing on the, ca on the phone can help, but I wonder if it helps enough I, to justify 108 numbers. I think it's there to get the 8K resolution, and I also think right. it's one of those features you can put on a pamphlet or uh, an advertisement yeah, exactly. and say, hey, look at this. Uh, a few other things to mention. 1.5 terabytes of storage with the SD card, because it has a micro SD card slot. That's something a lot of its competitors don't have. Uh, live captioning coming to the Samsung phones in Duo. Uh, there's a Global Goals app where you can make donations to UN sustainable programs, uh, and Samsung will match donations. And then real quickly, the Galaxy Buds Plus are the new version of the Galaxy Buds, basically with longer battery life, 11-hour battery life, and then you can get an additional 11 out of the case. They say three minutes minutes on USB-C in the case should give you an extra hour of listening time. A little bit better audio, dual dynamic driver system. Two mics on the outside now for noise cancellation, but not active noise cancellation, just for your phone calls. Uh, $149 coming February 14th. I don't know. Anybody need some new earbuds? Uh, I, I, the battery life stuff sounds great. Uh, I'm not sure about the rest of it. You kind of have to try these things out before you decide if you know if if, if it's right for you. But uh, the price is a it, that's a, if 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 they work well and the battery life is as good as advertised, I think it's priced well. Yeah, I think if you're a uh, Samsung Galaxy user, this is kind of a no-brainer. It's you know the ecosystem thing that others do very well as well. Hey, thanks everybody who participates in our subreddit. Samsung Stories and others show up there every day. You can submit stories that you care about and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can also join in the conversation in our Discord. And you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag real quick. Yeah, we got a really good... Nice email from Al from Ackworth, Georgia, who said, I commissioned Lynn Peralta again, so it's the second time, to do a drawing of my wife and I for our upcoming anniversary. Thanks for having Lynn participate in the show. Never would have thought of this otherwise. And another comment, I really like the editor's desk episodes. Getting into the process is very interesting, at least to me. Oh, thank you, man. I uh, appreciate that. Editor's Desk, if you don't know, is a special feature for patrons at the associate producer level and up. Uh, where I do a weekly 10, 15 minute talk about behind the scenes, how we do the show, a little more of my opinions on things. So if you're interested, um, you have to be a patron and then you get it in your RSS feed from Patreon. Also, Ben wrote in to point out uh, that uh, today is Patch Tuesday, meaning this is the first Patch Tuesday Windows 7 users have missed. Uh, so it oh. is now officially Windows 7 not mm -hmm. getting support. So uh, he says, I won't miss the monthly reboot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks yeah, well, to Alan I mean, Bedford for writing and, and everyone else as well. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Tony Glass, Rushan Brantley, and Adam Carr. An extra special thanks to Patrick Beja for being with us. Patrick, where can people keep up with the rest of your work? Uh, follow me on Instagram. Um, I am using Instagram a little bit more and stories. I'm young. I use stories, <laughs> which is a sure sign that I am young. Also, uh, go to frenchspin.com and subscribe to the Phileas Club. I'm not going to spell it, but 
frenchspin.com. We're doing our first Brexit episode tomorrow, post-Brexit. Uh, mm. I'm very anxious and excited and scared and sad to talk to all of my uh, former EU cousins and who are now uh, UK friends, I suppose. So it used to be four people from the EU on your Brexit episodes. Now it'll be 50% EU, 50% not. Yeah, it's now three from the UK and uh, Bart from Ireland is still on there. So he will be EU along with me. So it's two thirds EU, three, no, two fifth EU, <laughs> three fifth EU. Math. It's very, forget it. Yeah. Uh, but go check it out, folks. The Phillies Club, Frenchbin.com. Uh, also support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS. It's the way to get all those cool things I was talking about. And if you had feedback, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live. That's Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>